Um, uh, so show of hands, how many of you have heard of WebRTC before this morning when you Googled it? Uh, <laughs> Now keep your hands up if you ever use WebRTC. Alright, now of you guys, how many of you think WebRTC is easy? <laughs> well, uh, well, whether you've never heard of WebRTC before, or you've used it and think it's really, really terrible, um, I'm here today to convince you that WebRTC can be easy. Uh, so a tiny bit about me, I'm, I work at Stripe. Uh, we are based in sunny San Francisco. And at Stripe, our preferred means of communication is Google Hangouts. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but oftentimes Google Hangouts will lag, chats will be out of order, uh, you might get a chat five minutes later, um, and sometimes I can't even connect, which I'm sure you've all experienced today at the conference. Um, we could just turn around and talk to each other face to face, but I often can't express myself fully without emoji. <laughs> <laughs> a bit off with how chat works right now. Um, my message has to go from a client to a server somewhere far away and then back to another client that might be really close to me. So even though I'm sitting just 10 meters away from a colleague, my message has to travel all the way to the Google data center in the Dallas, Oregon. Um, and that is 1,000 kilometers or 600 miles. Uh, my message not only has to physically travel from San Francisco to Oregon, once it's there, I don't even know what's happening to it on the server. Or when the message will start its journey back to SF. So instead of this, why can't we take out the server and do this instead? Well, it's hard. <laughs> Some of you probably know about NAT. <laughs> um, but I'll explain it briefly. Uh, NAT is simply a sort of IP mask. It stands for Network Address Translator and turns your internal IP address, which you guys are used to as seeing, seeing as like 192.168.something.something, .1 uh, to a public IP address. Uh, this means that if two browsers want to talk to each other, they have to figure out A, if one or both of them are behind a NAT, and B, what each other's actual IP addresses are. Additionally, if we were to get past NAT and make a connection, we'd want our data to go over the wire securely. Um, so that a hacker like me can't steal your <coughs> chat. Uh, it's best to have a standard for this rather than rolling your own, of course. Uh, finally, web browsers have historically used CCP as its transport protocol of choice. Uh, but for many peer-to-peer -peer applications, such as real-time games and video streams, TCP becomes too slow. Uh, the good news is that WebRTC has solved these problems for us. So WebRTC stands for Web Real-Time Communication, and is a set of standardized APIs for peer-to-peer -peer video, audio, and data in the browser. It's plug-in list, meaning you can send files and stream video without having to download any apps or browser, browser extensions. Uh, and more specifically, it's a set of APIs uh, It's made out of these three components, Get User Media, RTC Peer Connection, and RTC Data Connection, or RTC Data Channel. Um, WebRTC has built-in NAT traversal, end-to-end -end security with DTLS, uh, and it introduces a lot of new transport protocols, including UDP and SCTP. And what's really cool is that it shifts the paradigm of apps in the browser, right? Because we're entering a world where the server never has to touch any data. And even beyond that, it's pretty cool that you can use UDP, which is unreliable transport, um, and it's useful for any application where the reliability and the order of sending messages doesn't matter as much, uh, such as real-time games or like if you want to build World of Warcraft in the browser. Um, SCTP is reliable transport, and it's speedier and more secure than TCP. So it's really cool that we have this now available to us. So, let us see it in action. I'm going to show you a quick plug-in list video chat demo. Um, so, uh, I just need to allow access to my camera and mic. So I'm going to call Alex Weston and Austin. <laughs> and he is not there. <laughs> 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 the US is not that cool, it's pretty close. 
Um, and it's theoretically supposed to just work, right? Cross browser, cross platform, and it's supposed to have built in security and map reversal and UDP. But, of course, there's a but. Um, WebRTC is in a much better state now than it was six or even two months ago, but it's still a reality that it's difficult to get a grasp on how the APIs work across browsers, and depending on, on how two spec that browser's implementation is. And even if you do force all your users to use Chrome, you have to deal with different versions of Chrome, and including mobile versions. So here is a great browser support table from iswebrtcready.com, and you can see that there's a lot of red and yellow. Um, so the yellow parts are the parts of the API that you'll probably struggle with most because these are the parts that are either not fully up to spec or are not interoperable between versions and browsers. So I guess the answer to that question is maybe. <laughs> um, so I wanted to make this whole process less of a pain, so I created and still maintain this library called PeerJS. Um, it's it's alright, popular, and people use it for real things, and it's really scary that they do. <laughs> um, I'll come back to this again later, but I want to take you through a bug that someone uh, filed two months ago. So the bug was that uh, Android data channels cannot communicate with desktop in Chrome 31 and 32. So that's strange, right? Because um, they're on the same version of Chrome. I got my hands on an Android device and checked the Chrome flag settings. Um, in Chrome 31, uh, SCTP is the protocol you use for the reliable data channels, and it's supposed to be behind a flag. So, uh, I couldn't figure out how to take a screenshot on Android, but uh, <laughs> a picture of the flag, the SCTP data channel flag, that is obviously there. Um, so, a strange flag wouldn't work. So, I Googled around and I searched the Google Linux Stack Overflow for WebRTC, which is the WebRTC Discuss Google group, um, which is a less searchable equivalent of Stack Overflow. Uh, it appears that this blue sensor bar guy um, knows that. <laughs> It's not supported until 33. Um, so I don't know who Blue Sensor Bar is, and it took me like five minutes getting from this page from the last because Google Groups has like Google Plus tipsies all over the place now. Um, but Blue Sensor Bar has posted a lot, and he seems legit. Um, and it doesn't work on Android, so Android must be lying to me. Um, anyone less jaded or not than I about WebRTC might hesitate to just believe this guy. Um, but after months of strangling with standards and trying to implement browser interoperability and like what they call Firefox-isms, um, I was more than willing to believe Blue Sensor Bar. So about today, it's still open. Um, I wrestled with a few hacks to detect whether SCTP was really enabled and uh, mobile, but nothing felt that satisfying. Um, so Chrome for Android stable is now in version 33, so I think I'll go close this book after the talk. Um, so there's just a few missing pieces from earlier. I'll go over them briefly because they're probably out of scope. But um, so Remember the magically send method where we magically sent an answer or offer from blue to purple and vice versa? Well, the surprise is that the peers don't just magically know how to call each other and send each other things before they make the connection. So we need what's commonly called a signaling server to initiate the connection. So something needs to relate the offer and answer. So you might be thinking that I misled you about not needing servers. But the configuration information is all the signaling server ever touches. It never touches any data. And once a peer connection is established, the server no longer plays any role in transport. One caveat is that if you want to add another data channel or add another stream after your connection is established, um, you'll have to go through the negotiation process again because the offer and answer were like snapshots of the previous time when you wanted to talk to your peer. Now, remember the dot 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 thing that we passed into the RTC peer connection? Um, it is actually a configuration object. So here's an example of a very simple config for an RTC peer connection. Um, so PC dot dot dot. It, and you pass in a bunch of servers, and no one really knows what it means. Um, so here's what it looks like on some older version of browsers. Specifically, this is Firefox. And Firefox required that you specify your stun server with IP address instead of URL. Um, and also, Firefox didn't support turn at all. And this is a data channel config. Um, this is a config for a UDP data channel. And this is a config for a UDP data channel on other browsers. So the acronyms you saw in the previous slide are STUN and TURN, and you'll hear these a lot, and especially when it has to do with getting past NAT. So there's STUN, which is Session Traversal Utilities for NAT, and TURN, which is Traversal Relay for NAT, and ICE, which is Interactive Connectivity Establishment, 
And these are the protocols used by WebRTC to facilitate natural result. Um, so third-party stun servers are typically lightweight and they're on the public internet. How they work is that the application or the, your client will send a message to the stun server and the stun server will respond with the public IP address and port of the client. Um, so in this way, you're able to figure out your IP address. The stun and ice method is actually only effective about 80% of the time and in cases where the PDP connection cannot be made, um, you can specify a turn server URL and it will fall back to the turn server. And it's basically like a last ditch effort to try to get your data to your peer. Um, and if no turn server is specified, the connection will just fail. Um, so the technical term for this is a symmetric NAT, and these are the cases where your connection will fail. So these things really add complexity to the simple WebRTC flow that I was advertising earlier. Um, and I'm going to show you a pretty terrifying picture now. Um, so you probably can't read the title of the slide, but it says, Simple Call Flow. <laughs> <laughs> so this diagram is supposed to represent the smallest set of events and signaling required to make peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, but of course, this includes interactions with STUN and ICE and rene renegotiation of offers when you add a new stream, um, among other things. It's actually really interesting if you want to take the time to understand it. But going back to the flying chicken example, we end up with something more like this, where we have our stun server, our turn server, our signaling server, and our ice candidates flying around. Um, but the good news is here that you don't need to understand any of this, because WebRTC can be easy. Um, and despite all the scary things I've just shown you, there are a few libraries out there that will make your life easier. So there's simple WebRTC, which provides a nice API for making media calls. There's a newer one called rtc.io, which um, is a bunch of smaller modules to facilitate media and data calls. And I haven't really looked closely at this one myself, but um, it, it should be fine. And there's PeerJS, which is a library that I maintain, and it provides basically an abstraction layer over peer-to-peer -peer data and media, as well as a server component and a cloud server if you don't want to run your own. So one thing that makes open, these open source WebRTC libraries look a bit different from like typical JavaScript open source libraries is that they require a bit of background knowledge about the WebRTC APIs in order to contribute. And so a lot of great developers will feel a little intimidated and don't want to contribute. Which is really sad because there are a lot of bugs in these libraries and um, two or three people can't fix them all. So now that we've heard this talk, I really encourage you to go out there and try to contribute to these libraries. So another demo. And so I started making this small WebRTC media library a few weeks ago called jQuery.peer. Um, it's the first time I ever demoed it. Um, I made it for this conference, and so let's see if it'll work. The goal here was to create a WebRTC connection, all the complex stuff I showed you before, in just one line of JavaScript. So let's make video chat. list of all my peers that are online right now in the jQuery TO room. And I can click that.
the intent was to have a media call in one line of paper. Okay, well, I'm happy to start taking any questions if you guys have any. Alex said he's on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> uh, for the Fire server in uh, ShareJS, mm -hmm. is that like a standalone implementation? Like if I was disconnected from the internet, could I use that? Or do I still need like a Google Stun server? To um, yeah, you'll still need a Stun server. Uh, but Google has one that they use for all their demos, <coughs> and so we've just been using that for now. <laughs> one might take it down. And any other questions? Uh, who's the major driving force behind like pushing the technology forward? Is there like a committee, or is there only based on like the browser vendors? Uh, right. So there, there is a committee, and there is currently a draft spec. So it looks like the internet's not really working with my feet. Yeah, so there's a there's a draft spec out right now, and they actually say we don't recommend that you implement this yet, because it's just a draft, but it seems like most of the major drafts have gone into it. Yeah, uh, do you have any uh, stand server, uh, I guess, open source servers that you don't have to rely on Google or Google? Um, yeah, I'm sure there are open source stand servers that I'd be happy to take a look after. So the benefit of using WebRTC versus Socket.io is just that with Socket.io you still need a server and you will end up with this kind of configuration rather than the direct peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so that means your data still has to travel the physical distance.
Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Michelle on GitHub, and you can see my slides at the link below. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. So uh, I think we have some time now. We're going to start. Uh, how much time do we have? Does anyone have a schedule? Uh, we have 23 minutes. Time for 23 minutes. So stretch your legs, take a break. 22. 22 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't mess it up. No time to stretch your legs. So we'll see you back here in 22 minutes. <laughs>